Good morning. It's our second day here in New England and we are headed from Cambridge into Boston to see the sights of Boston. We're excited. Ian has never been to Boston before, so we're really looking forward to today. We decided to kick off our stay in Boston with a tour of the city to get an overview of the landmarks and history. We could have been on a green duck or a blue duck or even the Coke Zero Sugar duck, but we got lucky and we got the pink duck, Dorchester Dottie. I'm going to give you an idea of what the tour was like with some audio from our tour and visuals that I captured during the tour. That is where Sam Adams is buried. Oh. There are three signers of the Declaration of Independence here. Sam Adams, Robert Treat Payne, and way over here, John Hancock. Do you see that tall granite obelisk in the center of the, the burial ground? Yeah, Y'all see that? It says Franklin. Benjamin Franklin is buried in Philadelphia. But his parents are buried right there. And if you look straight back from that a monument all the way to the very back. You are going to see the grave of Paul Revere. Boston Common is America's oldest public park. Here's our tour guide talking about its origins. There were over 400 Puritans living on one and a half square miles of land. And so none of them had, their, had much property when they were here. So what did they do? Well, they had a choice. They could either grow their food or graze their livestock. They couldn't do both. So what they did was they chopped down all of the trees that they would need for houses and for fuel. Never replanted the trees, used the green space as um, an area for grazing for the livestock, and then used their yards to grow their food. And across from the common is Boston Public Garden, the first botanical gardens in the United States. of the mama and her eight ducklings is in honor of the book Make Way for Ducklings. It's a tribute to Robert McCloskey who made the Boston Public Garden famous through his book Make Way for Ducklings. This is the George Washington statue in the public gardens. Here we have some of the stylish townhouses of Beacon Hill leading up to the Capitol. The homes next to Boston Common and the State Capitol are so pretty. This is the Massachusetts State House, AKA the State Capitol for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Now let's look at an important statue located next to it and hear about that historical figure. She is the reason why we have freedom of religion in our constitution. Yep, Mary Dyer was a Quaker. She wanted to practice her Quaker faith, but the Puritan said, uh-uh, ain't happening here. They kicked her out of town three times. And on the third time, they said, and don't come back, because if you come back, you will be hanged. And she came back. Here is the most fun part about choosing a duck for your city tour. You get to go from the street into the Charles River to see Boston and Cambridge from the water. Welcome to the Charles River. In the early 1600s, English explorer and soldier Captain John Smith was asked by King James to chart the New England coast. Here is the tour guide telling us the story about when Captain Smith happened upon this river. And when he came up here in 1614, he saw this river and he saw how huge it was. And as a result, he was so excited that he wrote back to King James and said, Your Majesty, you may change any of the barbarous names that you see written here for much more proper English ones. He showed those charts to his 14-year-old son, Charles, who said, Dad, look at the size of that river. Can I put my name to it? So he did, and that's, that's what happened. That's how the Charles River got its name. Turns out London is not the only city where architectural landmarks are given silly names. As you take a look at that bridge, do you see those four tall towers in the center? Those four tall towers resemble salt and pepper shakers. And so, we affectionately call this the salt and pepper shaker bridge. The actual name of the bridge is Longfellow Bridge, as in Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, 
the poet who wrote not only a poem called The Bridge, but also the famous poem Paul Revere's Ride. Does anybody know the real story of Paul Revere's Ride? Does anybody know how many lanterns went up into the um, steeple of the Old North Church? One if by land and two if by sea. That's a good way to remember that. The only problem with that is the next line is, one if by land and two if by sea, and I on the opposite shore shall be. It's a poem. Yeah, you learned American history from a poem. A rather flawed poem, too. That was Longfellow's poem, and he was not write, writing that for historical accuracy. According to Longfellow, Paul Revere is sitting in Charlestown, and he's waiting to see how many lanterns are going to go up into the steeple of the Old North Church. All right? Two go up there. Great. He spurs his horse. He takes off. He heads on to Charlestown and heads west, yelling, the British are coming. The British are coming. Two flaws to that. They're coming across the Charles River. They're coming across the Charles River. Nah, didn't happen. The two lanterns were for the 40 other riders who went out with him that night. And you know what none of them did that night? None of them yelled, the British are coming. The British are coming. Because everybody was British. This was a colony. It wasn't the United States yet. This shows a view of Cambridge from the river. To see more of Cambridge, please check out last Friday's video, which I will link above and below. See that gray building with the tan front and then has burgundy front and on the very top look like um, seven chimneys? That's the Moderna building. That's where the vaccine was created. And that is where it's still being created today. After the duck tour, it was time for lunch. So we snapped a quick selfie by the water and then walked over to the north end of Boston to enjoy some Italian food at one of the 105 Italian restaurants located there. It's a good time to be in the north end of Boston, in Little Italy, because it's October and it's Italian American Heritage Month. We are at a well-known Italian restaurant here called Limoncello, and we're ordering the two things it's famous for, the signature entree, the ricetta, and the meatball appetizer, which you have to be in the know about this because it's not on the menu. So we're fancy like that. We ordered off the menu. Some Italian bread and olives and Parmesan. There's the meatball appetizer. Only three meatballs, but they're pretty large and they're supposed to be the best meatballs in the country. Here is the famous rosetta dish. I guess they do kind of look like roses. They've got this amazing prosciutto and cheese inside and then a cream sauce with truffle. To give you the Italian vibe, the murals on the wall depict scenes from Venice, Florence, Rome, and Naples. You know you are in a legit Italian restaurant when there is an autographed photo of Robert De Niro on the wall. But right outside the restaurant, you are back in a very historic American neighborhood with Paul Revere's house virtually next door and Rachel Revere Square, named after Paul's second wife, across the street. And just down the road is North Square, where there's a monument remembering the men of this neighborhood who rode with Paul Revere, fought the British troops, and participated in the Boston Tea Party. In addition to the history, we loved the architecture of the North End and enjoyed wandering the streets admiring all the beautiful buildings, including many Copper Bay windows. This is the famous Instagrammable street, Acorn Street, the most photographed street in Boston. Colonial flag glowing in the evening sun. This is like a devil's door, this wee little door, wonder what it's for. Here's Rollins Place, which is famous for the optical illusion called Scarlett O'Hara's house. This home here at the end, which looks like a plantation in the southern U.S., but is actually just an optical illusion. 
Traveling between all the places we visited around the city, we did a lot of walking as well as biking, Ian's absolutely favorite way to explore a city, and taking the tea. Speaking of the tea, let me give you a wee bit of history. Boston has an impressive mass transit system and claims to have had America's first subway, which began in 1897. Now I need to share with you one interesting ride I had on this trip when Ian wasn't with me. I sat across from this chap and his trolley of fish, including one fish that didn't quite fit in the top box. It was a very smelly ride. I wish this were smell vision so you could appreciate the aroma of the experience. What is your funniest experience meeting colorful characters in the underground subway or tube? We found our way to Boston Public Market with a specific mission in mind, apple cider donuts. I heard that this market had amazing mini apple cider donuts. To see the even more amazing apple cider donuts I had a few days later, check out our New Hampshire fall foliage vlog, which I published two weeks ago. I will include a link above and below. We love food markets, particularly the ones in London. So it was fun to explore this one in Boston, Boston Public Market. There were all kinds of food here, including this booth, which had a great menu of popovers, America's version of Yorkshire puddings. Another topic about which I have made several videos. We're here at the Red Apple Farm so that we can get some of the famous apple cider mini donuts. And we're also going to get some cold apple cider, which in the US is not alcoholic. And here are the apple cider mini donuts. On camera, they look kind of big, but actually they are just wee little apple cider donuts and I can't wait to try one. That's delicious, really sugary, but you can taste the apple cinnamon flavor inside. Now I know why these are famous. They are super yummy. And now I turn the time over to Ian to show you his visit to the Boston Public Library. This is the beautiful Boston Public Library with its motto, free to all. Here we have the interior of the Boston Public Library. It is stunning. Just all kinds of interesting detail. Here in the entry of the Boston Public Library, we have the statue of Sir Henry Bain. He was the first governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and he was beheaded in 1662. Sir Henry Bain advocated for religious freedom and the abolition of slavery. This is the courtyard of the Boston Public Library. With the famous or infamous Hancock Tower in the background. This is the Abbey Room. It is covered with murals showing the story of Sir Galahad and his quest for the Holy Grail. Here in the Back Bay of Boston, a lot of the streets are named after British lords. They were honored for supporting America's cause of independence. I just wanted to capture some of the beautiful architecture and crazy Halloween decos here in the back bay. This is the famous Newbury Street full of restaurants and shopping. And here's a little Harry Potter wizard shop for all the wizard obsessed people. The Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum is a very unique museum experience and one I highly recommend when you visit Boston. 
there are two things that make it like no other museum I've visited. First of all, it is incredibly immersive and also intimate. As you'll see from the video clips that follow, you feel more like you are walking through a manor house, castle, or palace, rather than walking through a famous art museum. One of the most annoying things about the museum is also one of the best. The artwork doesn't have labels next to each piece. You have to look at the brochure or download a full listing from a QR code in each room. I hate downloading from QR codes, so that was frustrating. But the really lovely thing about no labels was that you felt like you were viewing exquisite artwork in a private residence rather than a stuffy museum. And the fact that the museum had wall coverings and furniture, which felt like rooms in a home, perpetuated that intimate feeling. The second thing that makes the museum like none other on the planet is that it was the location of the biggest art heist in history. And the theft still has not been solved. And the location of the stolen artwork remains unknown. The theft happened in 1990 during the St. Patrick's Day celebrations in Boston when two men posing as police officers escaped with 13 works of art valued at over $500 million, including the concert by Johannes Vermeer, the most valuable unrecovered painting in the world, and the storm on the Sea of Galilee by Rembrandt, that painter's only seascape, and many other items, including works by Manet, Degas, and others. The museum is named after its founder, Isabella Stewart Gardner, a passionate and brilliant billionaire art collector who had a bold vision of creating a completely unique art museum in the city of Boston. The museum building, which in my opinion is not extremely impressive from the outside, is a delight to discover once you walk in the doors. When the building was completed in 1901, Mrs. Gardner lived on the fourth floor of the building, personally overseeing the creation of the historic galleries on the lower three stories of the building. She created a stunning courtyard, which itself is a work of art, displaying within it many other pieces of artwork. She died in 1924, leaving the museum of her private art collection for the education and enjoyment of the public forever. She provided an endowment to ensure this happened and stipulated that no items be acquired or sold from her collection. I took an overwhelming number of photos and video clips inside the museum, but what I'm sharing now is just a recap of some of my favorite bits within our museum visit. You can see here the empty spot on the wall where one of the stolen paintings was taken, and another on this wall. These are an eerie reminder of the extremely valuable artwork that hopefully one day will return to its rightful place in this exquisite museum. Now let's recap a few of the other delicious things we ate in Boston, starting with a late night Japanese meal. I love me some miso soup. He's so hungry, that's right after all the bike riding Dara made me do this evening. Oh yeah, I think it was the other way around. Mm -hmm. And we have a beautiful organic salad full of yummy vegetables and a ginger dressing. I love Japanese ginger salad dressing. This is the biggest mountain of tempura I have ever seen. It's tempura mountain. It's got all kinds of vegetable tempura. And then these are shrimps or prawns because others are pretty giant shrimp. <laughs> That's where you get that oxymoron, jumbo shrimp. And our tasty dinner at Grand Tour on Newbury Street, including an endive salad with beets, apples, and walnuts, roasted sweet potatoes with caramelized onions and pecans and spicy honey, and the most colorful cauliflowers I've ever eaten, served with harissa labna, sultanas, and toasted almonds. If you watched our Cambridge video, and if you haven't, let me cordially invite you to do so after this video. Just click on the link below. That video shows us visiting two places Ian loves in Cambridge. And guess what? We had to go to the same restaurants again in their Boston location. This is Tate, Ian's favorite bakery. We went to breakfast here virtually every day. I never see pavlova here in the US. Those are beautiful.
I'm sorry to be sophomoric, but I just have to say that these delicious chocolate pastries look a lot like a certain emoji. Here is a recap of a couple breakfasts we had, including when we finally got something savory after all the sugar overload. We got an apple turnover, a morning bun, and a chocolate snail. Scrambled eggs with sun-dried tomatoes and goat cheese and spinach, and a really decadent challah French toast with ricotta and raspberry jam and strawberries and mint. And the other Ian favorite that we visited yet again was Amarino, also on Newbury Street. The gelato place Ian's in love with. Although this day it was so cool in the late evening that we opted to have the decadent, super thick Belgian style drinking chocolate rather than chili gelato. So I'm catching the tail end of the Boston Marathon here in the back bay of Boston. As we flew home to Texas, we saw lots of marathon runners in the airport proudly wearing their medals and their jackets. As we flew out of Logan Airport, it was a foggy view of Boston below. I hope you enjoyed the vlog of our visit to Beantown. Thanks so much for watching and do something good in the world today.